short si or short-sightedness of class consciousness first of all people literally were up my asshole for making fun of this guy in the lightest ways possible because i didn't immediately dick ride him into oblivion and say he's like the the savior of the working class like it's not like i was saying this is a genuine threat i just simply said this is classic dumbass like uh, welfare reform asking uh, silliness and the lyrics in the song are lord we got folks in the street and got nothing to eat and the obese milking welfare well god for five foot three and you're 300 pounds taxes ought not pay for a bag of fudge rounds fair enough fair enough from of a centrist working class hero who's just fed up with the system or does this strike you as the lyrics of a libertarian who does not really see his problems as the capitalist elite maybe political parties are his issue but he feels hard done by, you know, like I work hard, I go home, drown my sorrows in alcohol. A lot of people can relate to that because of capitalism. It's my vibe, as the kids would say. It's also what all country music should sound like instead of sounding as it so often does, like generic pop music with a slight twang. Most country music these days, like all other kinds of popular music, sound like it was, you know, it sounds like it was made by, uh, by an algorithm, not a person. Okay, so... I actually love folk music, be it the old wit and bite of direct anti-fascist messaging that speaks truth to power and actively engages in the struggle of the common folk. The songs about breaking bread with your neighbor, protest songs composed in direct opposition to the usurpers of land, songs bashing the factory owners for stealing the wages of their employees, and songs that pay tribute to those who operated both in the margins of society and the law. It's anti-war sentiments and focus on human rights above everything else, or it's nuances in the experiences of emotions like love, heartbreak, and turmoil. And specifically within the independent music scene, Folk has consistently delivered some of the most thoughtful and insightful singer-songwriters. With that said, Oliver Anthony is mad. It's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me, people like you. Wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Now, I don't want this video to be about how Oliver Anthony is a passive conservative plant. From my honest perspective, I can't necessarily get a full handle on what he believes, but I think that might be intentional. But before we get into that, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, which is me. Big thanks to my patrons. Because I work as a drummer, I was able to spend a lot of my time on the road, making new friends, as well as playing a variety of different locations. And on my Patreon, if you would like to become a patron, I have uploaded both full songs and concerts from these experiences. Other perks include having early access to some of my videos, my more personal takes about the art that I'm consuming, but more on that later. So who is Oliver Anthony? From what I can find, he's really a working class singer songwriter whose real name is Krista, and this song, Rich Men of North Richmond, completely popped off on YouTube and Twitter mid to late summer. The song was lauded by unremarkable ghouls, Bapshap, and theocratic fascist Matthew Walsh. On one hand, he openly stated that he does not want to be associated with conservative politicians, and that this song specifically is supposed to call them out. From his point of view, it's supposed to be antagonistic to both Democrats and Republicans. I've talked to hundreds of people the last two weeks. It seems like certain people want to just ride the attention of this song to maybe make them their own selves relevant, and that's aggravating as hell. The other thing that I find aggravating is, uh, well, you know, like, it was funny seeing my song in the, it was fun, it was funny seeing it at the presidential debate, because it's like, I wrote that song about those people, you know? So for them to have to sit there and listen to that, uh, that cracks me up. <laughs> Uh, but it was funny kind of seeing the response to it. Like, that song has nothing to do with Joe Biden, you know? It's a lot bigger than Joe Biden. Um, that song is written about the people on, the, on that stage. And a lot more, too. Not just them, but, but definitely them. But if that's the case, then why is homie having sit-down chats with open transphobes who crusade against wokeness? Or, you know... On the one hand, you have the advantage of going direct to consumer in the way that you've described, and that gives artists a tremendous amount of freedom. But if you're very, very careful and judicious in who you're partnering with, you can find people who will open up new avenues of opportunity for you without interfering with whatever it is that you value and what you have to bring. And 
you have to, the devil's in the details, man, because it, it boils down to the character. While they firmly align themselves with conservative politicians. It's important to note that he also chatted with folks with left-leaning beliefs and that he personally sees himself in the middle of the political spectrum. Uh, yeah, hey. Hey, um, <clears throat> I came up with a really great idea, dude. Yeah? I'm gonna play both sides. Why would you tell me that? Should I not have? Probably shouldn't, because if you're trying to keep a secret from me, well, now I know. I should have. Should I tell them? No, I don't think you should tell either side, because if you're trying to play both sides and they both know, you're not playing anybody. What should I do now? I don't, I don't give a shit. Why are you here? And even though some of YouTube's most notorious bigots found his video and signal boosted his song for their own political agenda, their opinions of his work aren't representative of his personal values, at least according to him. So what's his deal? Did the song blow up unexpectedly and is he just riding a wave while trying to maintain his bag? Well, we can probably find the answer to this question within the lyrics of the song that made him famous in the first place. So let's take a closer look at the song and suss everything out. Here we are fair and balanced. And honestly, I like Anthony's voice. So let's just go through these lyrics and get a full grasp on what he's talking about. So the first verse is pretty straightforward. He laments about working long hours with little pay, basically experiencing wage theft and how this experience takes up the majority of his waking hours. In regards to how our current economy is structured, it is those who own the corporations and the factories that gain the wealth and hoard it off of our own labor, all the while barely paying us enough to cover our bills and food. And these drastic changes have been constant in American history, but were exacerbated by the policies of Ronald Reagan in the 80s. But more on that later. During the pre-chorus, he acknowledges that his struggles aren't necessarily unique and that this is the reality for a lot of working class people. And the chorus harkens back to one of my favorite old head tropes. And this also cleared up a lot of confusion for me personally. While Anthony is rightfully clued in on rich oligarchs having control over our economy, he also rants a little bit about taxes, which screams Ron Swanson-esque libertarian to me. Never too early to learn that the government is a greedy piglet that suckles on a taxpayer's teat until they have sore chapped nipples. Cause like, while I can not admit that it sucks that a lot of our tax dollars go to the military and not enough to education or things that could provide proper infrastructure for the society that we live in. Taxes also fund a decent portion of our already clunky infrastructure, which is important cause we need roads and stuff, right? But I'll give Anthony the benefit of a doubt in that he's insinuating he doesn't like how the money's being used. But then the second verse of the song is where stuff gets kind of weird. He does a quick nod to the Epstein Island discourse, which involves major players of the elite on both sides going to an island and doing some pretty messed up stuff. But then he spends the rest of that verse just complaining about poor people. Not sure where to start with this because it's the bulk of the second verse and a pretty large part of the song if we want to keep it a buck. So he states factually that there are people on the street with no food, but then blames it on the obese milking welfare, which first off, what happened to Anthony Smoke with the rich oligarchs and the elites taking our money. But before I get too ahead of myself, let's take a closer look at these statements and see why they're so ass backwards. First, we could acknowledge that housing and food disparities are more commonly a result of a lack of resources, resources hoarded by greedy landlords, and food that is artificially inflated in price just to make corporations more money. And in regards to the whole fudge round welfare comment, different bodies are different, and there's no real reason to fat shame anyone ever, especially in a song where you're talking about how wealthy people hoard and take from the poor. But I don't want to center myself in this conversation about fat phobia, so I'll recommend a video on that right here. It's also important to acknowledge that a large portion of American towns and cities are riddled with food deserts, places or communities where there aren't a lot of grocery stores and having healthy food is loosely inaccessible, especially if you don't own transportation to drive to places. Also antagonistically contrasting people who use SNAP or food stamp benefits to the unhoused seems to highlight another glaring hole in Oliver Anthony's analysis. So let's dig into where these biases and assumptions come from. The myth of the welfare queen using up government benefits to avoid working wiggled its way into public consciousness during the Reagan era, as we discussed in this video, to widen the economic gap between poor black folks and other poor folks at the time. It actually plays a huge role in why millennials can't necessarily afford homes now. But to my point here, these policymakers mostly just wanted to cut down on spending, 
even though offering assistance programs is key to repairing the damage done by recessions and a bunch of wars we were losing and coups we were funding. And these changes weren't coming lightly. These were problems that people were very much in the know about. So in order to enact these policy changes and get folks back on the side of, quote unquote, big government. I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, and yeah, now y'all aren't quoting me on this. All right, I won't hear it. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigga, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we're, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never knew, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. One of the priorities of the Reagan administration was to adopt a more hands-off approach, insinuating that government is too big and plays too big of a role in how the economy functions. To do this, they just had to radically scapegoat poor people, especially those who were disabled, as if they were using government funds to get a free ride on the workers' time. And this scapegoating started with the welfare queen trope. This propaganda shift mainly started during Reagan's pre-president days with a woman named Linda Taylor. As we discussed, policymakers were looking to cut assistance programs, programs that gave so many boomers or their parents upward mobility and reliable jobs. Linda Taylor, born Martha Louise White, was one of the first girl boss scammers who finally gave them the scapegoat that they needed. So she did factually commit welfare fraud. But this is just a small portion of the story and doesn't really cover who she was, what she did or anything about her. It's kind of like if Jeffrey Dahmer went to jail for parking tickets. So she was born in the 20s and of mixed race heritage, which at the time was kind of illegal, had an understandably hard time finding employment and became a mother at 14 and was known for living fast and loose. She leaned on the fluidity of her racial identity to use a rotating cast of aliases and perpetuate welfare fraud, but also did a little bit of kidnapping and possibly murder. When prosecuted, attorneys couldn't make heads or tails of her statement because she just kept lying. She also created new identities on the spot and told nothing but stories. It was so extreme that psychiatrists referred to her as psychotic. Okay, so based on this information, it's hard to get a grasp on her mental health, but that's not even the end of it. When closing in on how much was actually stolen through welfare fraud, it's wild to find out that she only stole about $9,000, which would be $40,000 in today's money, which is by no means enough to live a super affluent lifestyle, even at the time, for more than like a month or two. But that didn't stop Reagan and his administration from using her as a postal child of big government spending and welfare abuse plastering her name everywhere, using it in ad campaigns, fabricating stories of her six-figure income, and how she was one of many Americans who took advantage of the system. Which isn't surprising if we even look at what Lee Atwater said. This solidified a long-standing stigma and stereotype around receiving help in general from the government that was primarily directed at Black women, painting them as lazy and duplicitous, which is annoying for a few reasons. First of all, I'm pretty sure a lot of us learned early on that we don't use the particularly egregious behavior or actions of one person as emblematic of an entire group of people. I don't assume all white folks are serial killers. Stereotyping poor folks does little to actually spotlight who's taking from the working class. And as we know, this didn't stop Reagan and other sensationalist politicians to go on a media crusade against welfare in the 70s and 80s. And even now, which is wild, because at the time, even though a 1978 report found that 1% of the annual budget 
went to unlawful use of welfare, most of which was chalked up to bureaucratic mistakes. But to wrap this up, Reagan's fear-mongering incentivized the working class to vote in favor of policies that made it harder to receive assistance from the government. Well, today we have an historic opportunity to make welfare what it was meant to be, a second chance, not a way of life. And even though the bill has serious flaws that are unrelated to welfare reform, I believe we have a duty to seize the opportunity it gives us to end welfare as we know it. And it also placed a racialized stigma on receiving government assistance. And to bring it back around, this is why I don't think the song is the working class anthem that folks say it is. Like it's incredibly valid to point a finger at those who are taking the wages of the working man, but fat poor people catching a stray out of nowhere makes no sense to me. And oddly enough, Oliver Anthony ends the verse stating that all this pressure is what's killing the working man, which, as we just pointed out, is the result of policies and not individuals gaming a system that already is antagonistic to them in the first place. And it's so corny and cliche to disguise blatant fat phobia as concern for one's health, when in reality you're just playing into the same moral panic over who deserves resources and who doesn't. And sadly, this is a pretty normative position in American politics specifically. Rampant individualism causes us to scapegoat each other instead of looking at how overarching frameworks and policies affect our lives. And on a personal note, just to rein this conversation in, the specter of the welfare queen has affected my life, just to be transparent. When I was young, my mom got sick, sick in a way that made it hard for her to find work because she was a newly disabled person. So we relied on assistance programs to stay afloat. But due to harsh cuts from Reagan's policies, it was barely enough. This isn't a unique situation either. About one in three adults receiving government assistance also have a disability. So it's important to understand how information and stigmas and stereotypes are framed. There's so much misinformation out there, spewed casually to get us to hate each other or judge each other. And outside of how the song offended me personally, the weird and blatant misinfo just shits on people who just need life-saving resources and assistance. And because of policies, can't get what they need. Yeah. So now that the dust is cleared and the song's been out for a few months, we can have a clearer understanding about why it popped off in the first place. From my perspective, the song being so politically underdeveloped seems pseudo-intentional. By leaving space open for vague populism of people getting shafted by the bigwigs, it allows the song to speak to a broad range of individuals, working class people who feel underrepresented. But by attacking the poor and engaging in some casual fat phobia, it signals that the song could also be popular with the culture war crowd. And this explains the right-wing AstroTurf campaign that happened around it, allowing it to pop off in the first place. Right? D, quickly, we don't have much time. Charlie and I doctored a paternity test to make it look like Frank is Charlie's dad. The reason I'm telling you all this is because I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. So, with this information, I'm going to leverage you guys into making me the head of security at the new Patty's Pub. Mm. Uh, okay, okay, a couple things right off the bat there, pal. Number one, um, never tell one side that you're playing both sides. Yeah. And number two, if you are going to play both sides, don't give away the information before you get what you want. Oh, shit. Right. Don't give away the information. Yeah. As an artist, when we're vague with our statements or lean into ambiguity with our political frustrations, it makes it easy for the messages of the songs to be distorted by bad faith actors. But that's just what I think. Not sure what the future holds for Oliver Anthony. But as a person who recently toured the South and heard the song blaring out of people's trucks and whatnot, uh, I'm hoping that he leans deeper into his analysis next time and can at the very least talk about the criticisms of the song because I haven't really been able to find interviews where he directly engages with it. And Anthony, if you're watching this and want to talk about it, I'm down. Feel free to email or DM me. But that's all I have. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you hate it, thumbs down or let me know how you feel in the comments. If you'd like to see more stuff, have early access to the videos that I'm making or tour footage slash full shows of me playing in different locations, as well as drums only versions of the songs that I've covered on my other channel. Consider joining my Patreon 
And yeah, I think this is the end of my country music arc. I'm hoping to examine any other genre of music now because I'm... (laughs) 